Good morning, Summerland Baptist Church. It's nice to see all your faces here this morning and hear you chit-chatting. <laughs> Whether you're looking back at me today here or joining us online right now or joining us later, it's so good to be with you and be part of the family of God, worshiping him together. Amen? This morning, um, I forgot my sheet of paper. That's okay. Trevor's at home getting it, but he did not make it in time. Also okay. <laughs> this morning, Pastor Dal is going to be speaking in on In All Your Ways, Acknowledge Him, continuing our series on trusting the Lord. And when I started to think about In All Your Ways, Acknowledge Him, it's kind of a big thought, and I was a bit lost. And then I hear God speak just so softly as he does. He said, I am Lord over all things. And I started thinking about the hustle and bustle of life, the pace that some things we can get wrapped up in, and just hearing him say, I'm Lord over all of that. And so for me, acknowledging God in everything means in all the things, in the busyness, in the big things, in the hustle, in the pauses, acknowledging that he is there, sovereign, Lord over it all. And boy, did I sigh with relief, because he is. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm thankful for our church. And I'm thankful for you here this morning. And these girls. And my son over there. <laughs> Let's pray together. God, thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you that we are free to worship you together today. And thank you that you are Lord. You are sovereign over the big, over the small, over our worries and our cares. You are Lord over everything. And we thank you and we praise you. God, you are so good and you are here with us always. I pray that you would be with Pastor Dell as he brings your word. May it speak to our hearts and guide us as we walk clumsily towards you. Amen. I'm Tiana, and I'm getting you guys in the know. I always do this. I'm Tiana, <laughs> and I'm getting you in the know for May 22nd. <laughs> Del wanted me to pass on a huge thank you to everyone who went down to the Gleaners last week. He said that it was an awesome time, and you guys participated in feeding thousands of people across the globe, and that is something to celebrate. So once again, thank you. This Thursday, 1.30, Eyes on Truth is having their season finale. And this is actually the finale for all our adult programming for this ministry year, as we call it around here. And so it's going to be fun. You guys have the tenors coming to sing with you, as well as some great food and snacks I hear and some conversation around tables. So you should join them for that final event. But not to worry, there is some special events throughout the summer, and you can check those out at the schedule available at the Hub. Did you know that twice a week, our youth are gathering to learn and pray and study the Bible? And we have a high school group and a middle school group that meets. And just this last week, we had our annual grade five study starting to meet with Pastor Bree after school on Tuesdays. Take a little look. Looks like you guys are having a great time at your study and we can't wait till you get to join us in our SBC youth program in July. <laughs> Here's a couple of pictures. It's hot in here. I'm Deanna and you guys are now in the know. You got the perfect right. announcement. Deanna, you are famous. I'm <laughs> So, what are you guys doing here? Now, I, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but on the other hand, I really mean that. What are you doing here? Reason being, why do you come? Maybe you come, well, it's Sunday. It's what you do. Maybe you're thinking, well, I, you know, I like the music. Well, usually. Uh, or or I, like, I like particular speakers, or there's programs for the kids. But let me ask you again, what are you doing here? I'm not, I'm not looking for you to answer out loud, okay? But I do want you to answer that and think that process through. It's partly why what we're, we're doing this, this first song, which is an, it's an 
old song. It's not a hymn. It's an old song you may not have sung uh, in some time. But this song in the chorus says, actually flip one uh, ahead. It's all about you, Jesus, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me, as if you should do things my way. You alone are God, and so I surrender. So as we sing, I'd like you to ask that question in your own heart. What, what am I doing here? Lacey Dawn talked about acknowledging him in all of our ways. This is what we're talking about today. So that you would take your thoughts, your heart captive, and today would be about him and what he has to do and to say and to share and to transform in your own life. So let's sing this together. I'm going to let you stay seated for this one. So uh, uh, give some thought as we sing it together. If 
was a prayer of your heart and we will continue on but first we want to dismiss all of the kids so uh, some of you go this way and some that way and some that way and over there <laughs> so yeah just go just get out of here okay good all right terrific Actually, as a, a, a great group today, we weren't sure how many people would be here with all the, you know, the long weekend, all of that. There's still kids and youth and uh, the whole age gamut. So thanks for carving this time out uh, of your weekend to be here. going to ask you to stand and join us uh, in another uh, old one, but again, that draws our direction where it needs to be. Sing. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy Most of you will recognize the tune from O oh Danny Boy in our next number, but the lyrics here focus on God's grace. And in spite of our many faults and our sin, Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross makes it possible for each of us to be forgiven, recognizing that forgiveness is nothing we could ever earn or deserve, but it is by his grace that we are saved. Join us as we sing. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. 
For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall Our next song, His Life for Mine, may be familiar to some of you. It speaks about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us, and it emphasizes how truly one-sided and sacrificial this act was. Jesus, our innocent and sinless Savior, went through unimaginable agony for our benefit. As the song indicates, his heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin so that now I am clean. His scars of suffering brought me healing. He was despised and rejected and stripped of his garments, yet now I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. Jesus did all of this to save you and me, undeserving as we are. He gave his life for mine and for yours. Listen carefully to the words and let them settle in your heart. And just before we sing this song, I'm going to have the ushers come forward. And this is not when the lyrics are going to be on the screen, so you're going to have to pay attention and catch those lyrics that Dave has shared as we sing them. Uh, if ushers come forward, let's pray and, uh, and let's offer.
to the Lord. We're not going to take the offering. We're going to let you offer it, right? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. And as Dave has reminded us again that it is your life that was given to us. It's why we're here today. And oftentimes, Lord, when it comes to offering, we evaluate, well, let's see, what's mine and what should I give? But, Lord, truly all that we have belongs to you. And that as we give, it would be with that heart, Father, with thanksgiving. Whether we give in cash, in check, and put it in the offering plate, or whether it's online, Lord, all of that stuff. I even think of myself as it's an automatic withdrawal, and it's just easy to let it go and never really think of what the point is. So, Lord, we offer to you, acknowledging that it all belongs to you. So, Lord, this is our time and our talents, our abilities, our connection with other people, our finances, all that we have, Lord. Take and use all of these things and transform us in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried for my burden. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine. His life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me, what love divine he gave his life for mine. His scars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy untold. His life for mine. His life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me, what love divine, he gave his life for mine. Rejected, stripped of his garments and oppressed. I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? Uh, Pastor Lee come up in a, in a second and he's going to uh, make some announcements but 
this song I want you to sing with us kind of as a response to that last song. And this is, again, an old song called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. So as we start thinking about what it is God's going to share with, with you, as he has shared with me, that it would be the prayer of our heart that he'd open the eyes of our heart to see stuff that maybe we haven't seen before. Because lots of the times we think, okay, the scripture says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, yeah, we, I, I have ears. I, I can hear. But he wants us to tune into a whole different level when we sit before him, that we would hear all the nuances of his heart, even when they go against what we want to hear. So um, maybe this morning, if you would stand for this one, let's sing this together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the
best of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome here. I wanted, I wanted to just, well, I wanted to welcome you well, but I don't welcome well. I'll be honest, I'm not a great greeter, welcomer to be, like, it's not kind of a natural thing for me. I don't know. I don't know where to put my hands. I don't know the exact right words to say. But some of you are really good at being very, like, welcoming and like, hey, welcome here. And it's very, like, kind and very simple, and you're not saying a silly joke, and then go, I wonder if I should have said that joke, because maybe they took that the wrong way. So, I'll tell you what we're looking for, is we would like to create a first impressions team. Now, we've had this for a long period of time, but who would be a part of this first impressions team? People who are working at the coffee counter, people who greet at the front door when people first come in, whether we have guests, or whether it's just all of you as our regular church family come in to be greeted by someone with a warm smile, or our usher team as well, who you know take you to your seats and they take offering and they serve us in that way and assist us during the service. That first impressions team is really, really important and it gives us you know a great first impression, but it also serves us as a church family really, really well, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, just being connected, knowing that someone knows our name. Someone said hi to me, someone smiled, someone shook my hand, you know what I'm saying? And so, if you're just relying on me to remember all of the names, you will be very disappointed. It is probably the worst thing, I'm so horrible at remembering names. I even forget my own kids' names from time to time, but that's usually just when I'm angry. But either way, we need some of you who are really great at greeting. Now, we've got a great group of volunteers at Usher, and they greet. Um, and we've got a coffee counter has started up again, and we're really appreciative of that. Um, but what I think what we're doing is we're looking for new people that have maybe never ushered before or never greeted at the door. Um, we're looking for anyone in, in their teens and young adults and parents' age and empty nesters, as well as our seniors. We'd like a l wide variety of greeters, not just the same people that have been greeting here for the last 20 years. And they're amazing at it, and that's why they do it, but there's only a few of them, and we're, we're wearing them out. There's a lot of people to greet. So if you're interested in that, would you contact us at the office or even just grab me at the end of the service, and we'll start just taking down some names, and we'll start putting a first impressions team together. Is that good? All right. Um, the second thing is, and, and we want to give our deepest uh, condolences, um, because our dear friend, and I... John Chomlack passed away this week. For some reason, it's just like whenever I have to say a name from the front in the moment, your mind goes blank. See the remembering names thing? But our dear friend John passed away. Um, if those of you who don't know who John is, if you ever saw Back Porch um, do their thing up here, the, the bluegrass band, he's the banjo player. Um, and he's been around here for a long time. They, Mary and John have served here at the church, have done a, a ton of different uh, ministries and have been part of our church family. And so, Mary, just our deepest condolences um, as you grieve. But we're also celebrating with you because we know where John is, and he is face-to-face -face with his Savior. Um, and so that's, it is grieving, but in joy as well. And so we just, we want to walk with you in that. If you are interested in coming and being a part of the, the funeral service and, and, to, and to be here and to grieve with Mary and family and friends, uh, it's at 1 p.m. this Friday. So 1 o'clock this Friday here at the church. And then there'll be a tea to follow downstairs in the gym at 2 p.m. So, and there's, so we just invite anybody from the church family that wants to come and participate in that. 1 p.m. on Friday and then 2 p.m. there's a tea to follow. Okay. Lastly, I'm going to be away this week from Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm going to be in Calgary for the CBWC Assembly. So just think of it as the yearly AGM for our conference. Um, so I'll be in Calgary for three days, and we just be in prayer for that, um, as that's where you make some decisions and policy, and you talk about different issues and things. And so just be in prayer uh, for us as we, as we talk through things. So why don't we bow our heads and pray? We're going to pray for Mary and her family, uh, but we'll also pray for the CBWC as well. Lord Jesus, uh, there's lots 
going on as we get into the spring. I think even think as we, um, it's May long weekend and we have lots of families that are out and traveling and going camping and, and getting out and re-engaging. I think of the car show that was in town here yesterday um, and seeing lots of people around. Lord, as we are engaging back into community, um, Lord, we recognize um, that that's going to take a little bit, that's going to take a minute. And so we just pray that you just continue to guide and direct us and, and show us our part as a church on how we can serve our community well and serve each other well um, as we re-engage back into community and caring for each other. Lord, we do pray for Mary and we pray for her family as they grieve the loss of John this week. Lord, we also celebrate in that and knowing that John is with you um, and playing banjo in heaven with you right now. And, uh, and so, Lord, we're just so thankful that he loved you and that he worshipped you and that he had a, just a life that honored you. And so, Lord, I pray that as he's left that legacy for those of us still here, that we would honor that legacy, that we'd be able to step into that. Uh, but also just be with, be with Mary uh, as she goes through this time and our church, and church family and close friends of John as well. And, Lord, we also pray for the CBWC assembly that's happening this, uh, this week. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for discernment. I pray that uh, your spirit would be at the center of all of our discussions and all the decisions that need to be made. Lord, we do pray um, very wholeheartedly um, that as we lead into the next season of ministry, whether here specifically at our church or as a denomination as a whole, Lord, we want you to be at the center of that. We want you to be guiding and directing us by your spirit. And so, Lord, give us the ears to hear you, the eyes to see where you are moving. Lord, change our hearts in the places that need to be changed. Pray that you soften it to your ways and your will. So we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you don't leave us, you don't abandon us. Pray for Dal now as he speaks. Pray for clarity. Thank you for the preparation that he's put into that. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to bless and build him up. Pray this in your name. Amen. Dal. Thank you, Lee. So we are um, still in our series from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 on trust. And you'll remember that passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And here's the one that we're working with today. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then we'll get to, and he will direct your paths. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, and we'll just leave that on the screen, but I, I, I want you to really get serious of what it is in all your ways, acknowledge him. Do you, do you remember that um, passage in, in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is doing all kinds of stuff and saying all kinds of things to the people? And there's some of the stuff that isn't going over very good. And as a result, people start leaving, saying, well, pff, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to that. I, I don't agree with that. That's not what we have been told. And so people left him. And then it's an interesting passage in Matthew 16, where it says this, Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. He began asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah, but still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And here's the question I want to ask you today. Jesus says to them, okay, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I want to ask you that today in your own heart, and let me say that I'm going to put words in his mouth because the Lord Jesus is asking you that today. Who do you say that, that I am? Well, Peter, in response to that, he says that very famous thing. He says, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and after that, Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And then he says, and I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And the fact of the matter is, we have wrongly interpreted that to say, oh, so everything is based on Peter. He's the guy on, the, on this, on you, Peter. I'm changing your name to the rock, so we're going to build the church on you. In fact, the Catholic Church believes that because of that statement right there is why Peter was the first pope. 
But when you think about it, when he said, I'm changing your name to Peter, what he changed his name to was Petros, which is a pebble, or a chip off the old block, if you will. Not bedrock. Petra is the bedrock. Peter was named a pebble, and the truth of God is what Peter said, which is what the church is built on, the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the truth. And we oftentimes, we say, okay, well, we interpret things in a particular way. But Peter got it because it was revealed to him. So what is it in all your ways to acknowledge him? Now, let me, let me ask you, um, what are some real iconic Bible passages? This is one of them. What are some of the iconic Bible passages that when you think of a verse in the Bible that immediately comes to your mind? Just, just shout a couple out. John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world. That's right, gave his only God sent to What's another one? Just a real iconic one. See, so what is it? Yeah. Yes, and just quote, can you quote it? There you go. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Very well-known one. Any others? Which says? Faithful and just. That's right. Any others? A new commandment I give unto you. Do you love one another? There's a whole bunch of them. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Right? Love one another as I have loved you, John 15. We could list a whole bunch of those. This is one of them. And isn't it interesting how we memorize those bits and pieces? How many of you know what is the next verse after this one? Verse 7, do you know? I, I didn't, you know, when I was thinking about it, I didn't know it either. And then when I looked, I realized, oh my goodness, isn't it interesting how I just stuck with these ones? Here's the next verse. Don't be wise in your own eyes. How did we miss that? We just never quite got there. And unfortunately, what we tend to do is we take these great iconic verses from the Bible and we quote them over and over and we find all kinds of places to use them and we sometimes miss what comes afterwards or maybe before or the context that that verse actually is in. When, when our boys were young and growing up, and I hate to mention this because Luke is here and he might get the shakes, but when, they were, when the boys were young, we took them to Awana. Awana is a Bible memory program where you memorize copious amounts of Scripture, and then when you give it back, when you quote those passages, you get prizes and awards, and then it's a competition, and you memorize this stuff so that you can memorize more than the other guy, and you can get a prize, and then if you're really good, you get to compete against people from other churches, and then other towns, and then there's great big Awana conve conventions, and you, can, you memorize whole books of the Bible and the whole thing. And in many ways, it is one of the most negative things if you are a kid who maybe struggles a little bit to memorize, you have a hard time with it, and then you feel like an idiot because somebody else did so much more than you, or the person who's leading it is heavy-handed, and they tell you, what's wrong with you? you need, why didn't you get it right? And you lose. You're a loser. How many people went to Awana, learned all kinds of scripture, and then walk away from the Lord because they never, ever met the one of whom those scriptures speak of? We can do exactly the same thing because this is not the point. Let me say that again. The Bible is not the point. And unfortunately, especially in our North American culture, Christian culture, we have made it the point. The fact of the matter is, it's the one who it is speaking about who is the point. Do not be wise in your own eyes. So when we think about our third line there, in all your ways acknowledge him. Now, the Israelites and we, we acknowledge God to a point. We acknowledge him to a point. 
but then we tend to choose kind of alternatives that feed our own ego. Now, this is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve came, and they walked with God. You, you watched them, and you saw the very qualities and character of God. They bore his image. The Bible says that they were created in God's image. However, when they were tempted by the serpent, what was that temptation? That temptation was, oh, oh, don't worry. You, if you eat from that fruit, you won't die. You will be like God. They were already in his image. You don't need God. You can be like him without him. Just eat. You don't have to obey. You don't have to do what he says. Just go ahead. You see, when we're thinking in all your ways, acknowledge him, that means fully surrendering your ways. And unless you evaluate what are my ways and I surrender those things, you're probably going to grab onto them and you won't even realize it. This is a very violent discipline to surrender all our ways and truly acknowledge him for who he is. This means self-relinquishment. It's kind of like, like during the offering and saying, everything that I have is yours, Lord. And this is simply, by offering, it's simply an illustration that it all belongs to you. Now, just to give you an example of how we, we tend to make this idea of acknowledging trite, the Hebrew word in Scripture, the Hebrew word is yada, to know, to become equal acquainted with as a dear friend and become known fully, to comprehend fully. Now, do you know that that word yada is where we get the phrase yada, 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 yada? It's like blah, blah, blah. In other words, I know, I know, I know, I know. Somebody starts giving you information, and we just go, yeah, yeah, yada, 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 yada. I know, I know. it. Don't tell me. I got it. I understand. That's exactly what we tend to do. I acknowledge God. I know him. I know that verse. Said it a million times and the whole thing. And so we don't go deep. We stay on the surface, and we go, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm not going to have a soft heart. I'm not going to allow him to, to help me unlearn things. Yeah, I want to learn. I'm just not willing to be taught. This is the attitude, the natural attitude of our hearts. Now, rather than just taking that verse and going, in all your ways, yada, 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 what I want to do, and this is probably the first time you have heard a sermon preached out of the Webster's Dictionary, because what I'm going to do, I was shocked when I looked up the word acknowledge in the dictionary, and there's four concepts that it lists and they are fantastic, and I'm going to use those as four points. Here's point number one. To admit to be real or true, to recognize the existence of with no falsehood. Now, you, you remember when I was talking about in his image, in the garden, they were in his image. We, we use that phrase so many times. We use that phrase, and of course, we just assume that, oh, yeah, you know, we're all created in God's image. Of course, we all are. Why do we claim that? We claim that because it says in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, that God created them in his image. Well, well then what happened at the fall when they chose independence from God? What happened? What was lost? They were still alive. I would submit to you that what was lost was the image of God. We say that because it gives us some degree of credibility. It justifies us. We're, come on, we're created in the image of God, you know. It justifies our existence. It proves our value. See, when we acknowledge him in all our ways, really, then we bear the image of God. But until then, what we're doing is we're bearing the image, as it says in Genesis 5, 1 to 4, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters born in their image. It doesn't say in the image of God. In Adam and Eve's image. You and I come from that exact same line. I would submit to you, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to be a heretic here. Although, 
Years ago when I did my ordination, they, I, I made the statement to the ordinating council that I don't believe we're born in the image of God. And they questioned me on this. And I told them what I'm going to tell you. And they said, huh, interesting. I never thought of that. The idea of being born into his image, we are, my, I would submit to you, even though this might be semantics, because yes, do we bear the image of God in terms of biological life? Intrinsic value? Absolutely. Without him, we would cease to exist. However, I submit to you that we are not born into his image. We are reborn into his image. John 3, 3. You must be born again. Why do you have to be born again? Because we need to be born again into new life in Christ. Christ takes up residence in us by our, his invitation and us accepting that invitation. He reaches down to us And when we accept that invitation, we are reborn. Yes, all man bears a residue of the Creator with intrinsic value, biological life, and all of that. But how many feel that I'm born in God's image, and if that's the case, all I need to do is just fan that image into flame? Well, if that's the case, why did Jesus even need to come? I'm already in the image of God. I just have to try harder. Maybe do more. Let me give you an idea, some passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, And just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. There's the passage in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, not that one yet. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that talks about we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In other words, the treasure of God, the image of God, we have in earthly vessels when we have Christ. The treasure, it indwells us, and then we bear it. Or, for example, in 2 Corinthians three seventeen, it says... But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. We are being transformed every day. He dwells in us in fullness, and part of the process of us acknowledging him is is as that definition says, to admit it's not me, it's not even in me, it's only him. And as a result, I I recognize the existence of and he becomes seen in me. Then we move on to Colossians 3.10. You have a latent side, the old self, with all its evil practices that we still have when we're in Christ. And it says... And you have put on the new self when we have invited Christ into our life. Put on that new self, which is being renewed day by day to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We are being renewed into the very image of God more and more. As I get out of the way and he is seen in me more and more, this is the process of renewing and transformation. And then, of course, there's 2 Corinthians 3, 3 to 5. You are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Not that we are adequate in and of ourselves to consider anything as coming from us, but our adequacy is from God, indwelt and transforming us into His image. You see, without the indwelling Christ, we are incapable of being image bearers. Let me say that again. Without the indwelling of the Spirit of God by the presence of the resurrection life of Jesus, without that, we are incapable of being image bearers of God. So when we admit and then submit to the truth of Jesus, we acknowledge him. We don't produce his image, fan it into flame. We show up and we acknowledge him. And he produces his image through our lives. Second definition, to show, reveal, or express recognition of or realization of. 
to show. It's like a reflection, all right? That's what it is to truly acknowledge. In 2 Kings 17, it says, And the sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against the Lord their God. Secretly? Secretly to who? It's not secret to God. He sees all of that. The one, basically, who it's secret of is ourselves. We try and produce something that's not possible in and of ourselves. And then it goes on to say, and they followed vanity and became vain, and they went after the nations that surrounded them, according to which the Lord had commanded them, don't be like them. Boy, oh boy, is that ever applicable to our culture right now. So what does that vanity mean? It means excessive pride in one's appearance, skills, achievement, and profile. I want people to see me the way I want them to see me, not necessarily the way that I am. This, before God, is an attitude of control and autonomy and arrogance. I want what I want. I love the passage which is called the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, and these words shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign, not a sign, a sign, on your hand and forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, we can either take that and make that a part of us, or... Have you ever seen on TV the Hasidic Jews with the black hats and the outfits, and they have the curls down the side, and they will have a box on their forehead tied to their head, and they have a, a leather tie on their arm, and they have a, they'll have a box on their arm. Those are called phylacteries, and they contain that scripture that we just read. So in other words, in the process of of teaching these words, uh, sorry, these words will, will be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit down and all of that. Bind them as a sign on your hand and your forehead. Okay, good, I get it. I'll take that scripture, I'll put it in a box, and I'll tie it to my forehead. Now, we know, if we really think about it, that means allow it to enter your mind and affect everything that you say and do on your arm for all your actions that they would bear out what the intent of that verse says, rather than just say, oh, okay, that's good. I'll just take that piece of scripture on that paper. I'll stick it in the box, and I'll tie it to my head. See, to show or express recognition of it says is to put into action, not just be in word. Um, we want the real deal, not just a facsimile. Uh, I, I had my classic car down at the car show yesterday, and I was talking to a guy who didn't have his car there, but he says, yeah, I've got this car. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not the real car. It's not a kit car either. It was, it was kind of manufactured to be just like the original. And it's like he felt guilty telling me because it's not an original car. It, but there's some kits, there's this and that. It wasn't the real, and he, and he felt bad about it. You see, the real deal, the point of origin, is what shows up in your lives and mine. I, I was thinking about showing you a video clip of this next slide that's coming up. This is of Richard Wormbrandt, who was tortured at the end of the 1940s, 49, in Romania. And basically, with the communist regime, they were trying to beat out of people their acknowledgement of God. He spent 17 years in prison. If you've ever read his book, it's so hard to read. And I was going to show you a clip, but I decided against it because it's too hard to watch. But it is a clip of him, and they show what they would do for him is they told him, don't you dare acknowledge God or pray to your God. It was very much like Daniel. Remember when Daniel got thrown in the lions? Very much like, don't you dare. But Wormbrandt, he knew what he was called to do. So there was a little peephole in his door, and the guards would go and look, and they would see him all bloodied and mangled, kneeling on the floor of his cell in prayer. 
and they would drag him out of there. They would tie him up into this rack and beat the bottoms of his feet with rods, with rubber mallets, and the whole thing. They did this to him for 17 years. He never walked again. Even after he was released, he never walked again properly. And this, in this clip of the movie, it shows him in this cell, this filthy cell with rats and the whole bit. He's kneeling down in prayer, and the guard opens the people and sees him in prayer and comes in, and he, and he yells at him, and he says, What in the world are you doing? We have taken everything from you. We have taken everything that you've ever owned. Your family is gone. You've been in here. You're going to be in here forever. What could you possibly be praying about? And he looked at the guard, and he says, actually, I'm praying for you. And the guard was just stunned. And he went out, and I won't go into the story to tell you how the true, authentic character of Jesus in that man was instrumental in the transformation of scores of lives in that prison incredible. You see, it's shown in action, this acknowledgement. It's shown in the, not just our attitudes, but our words are the actions of our lives. The third definition is to recognize the ultimately ultimate authority of. To recognize the ultimate authority of. Now, I, I got a picture of a compass up here. I want you to consider a compass, and I want you to consider this fact that east, west, and south do not exist. Now think about that. East, west, and south do not exist. The only thing we know is you have a compass, a compass points to magnetic north. That's it. It doesn't point to east, west, or south. East, west, and south only exist in reference to magnetic north. When you know where north is, then you can determine where east, west, or south is. And using this as an illustration, basically some people live in east, west, and south in our culture, and maybe you do, without acknowledging they only exist in relation to magnetic absolute north. The one who is the source, the one who is our all in all. Everything that exists must be defined and evaluated in the context of the one who is the constant. Space, for example, you, if you go out into space, good luck taking a compass up there. There is no orientation in space. There's no magnetic orientation besides the location of prominent heavenly bodies like the sun or constellations or galaxies, and even they are in dynamic movement in space. True life, everything that exists, is only evaluated in context to the source, one who remains the same. Faith only exists in the context of an absolute standard orientation. Scripture talks about a plumb line, that points, that you can count on it. Uh, my son's business called Acrobus. Acrobus is that is a Greek word that talks about that. It's the word where accurate comes from. It is the absolute. It's level. It's plumb. It's integrity. It's the things that remain and do not change. Life is only and eternally measured, evaluated in reference to the only source of life. All others are either proven, authentic, or facsimile by the standard. This car that this guy was telling me about, you probably wouldn't know unless you had an original right beside it, and then you could tell the difference and evaluate everything from what it's made out of and, and, and the fingerprints of the Creator. Scripture explains this. Romans 11.36 says, For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. And then Colossians 1, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things are being created by him for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is supreme. He is absolute. He is the source 
And we are just foolish if we evaluate virtually anything in life or our culture if we evaluate that outside of the one who is the point of origin. Fourth definition. To show or express appreciation or gratitude for. That is part of what it means to acknowledge. Now let me ask you a question. Is your gratitude to Jesus prominent? And I think probably you would say absolutely if you belong to Jesus. Well, let me show you what prominent means. Prominent is to stand out and be easily seen. So I've just made a picture of a pie chart here. That's prominent. Yes, there is a piece that's out of that, but the other is the biggest part. That's what it is to be prominent. And I would say that's what you and I struggle with to the degree of prominence that, that our gratitude to Jesus, our acknowledgement of him would find its place. And this is in contrast to here what it is to be preeminent. Preeminent is superior and all surpassing. It's a pie chart without a pie. It is an acknowledgement that everything is found here. There is nothing taken out of it to claim as our own. It's kind of like when we talk about baptism. Baptism comes from a Greek word called baptizo. And what the definition of that word is, is whelmed where we get a word like, I'm overwhelmed, I am consumed by, above, below, left, right, inside, outside, I am completely whelmed with. That's why we, as Baptists, we simply do the immersion thing. It's a complete immersed immersion in that water as our lives are to find Jesus as the preeminent one, not just a prominent one. Now, does that mean that every other kind of bab doesn't mean anything? No, it's an illustration, okay? It's an illustration. So how Jesus was baptized, that's why we do it that way. So other people can have the same attitude. If they chose whatever, sprinkling, or if somebody is ill in the hospital, I've done that before, and that, I can't go and dunk them in a tank. But in their, their mind, and their heart, they are completely immersed in the goodness, the forgiveness, and the grace of Jesus. There's an incredible commercial, and I, heard, I saw this on a documentary some years ago, about a radio ad, and I believe it was in Germany, actually, and I wasn't sure if I had just heard it right, so I remembered the, uh, the one who made this podcast, who is a marketing guru, and I emailed him, not sure if he would ever get back to me, and he got back to me the same day, and he said, yes, that was in my documentary, and it was a radio commercial, and he said, I was at a, a big thing in France where we were evaluating all uh, international advertising, giving awards for the best ones, and the one that won that year was a radio ad. And it was back in the 80s, and he said, what it said is on the radio came this statement. All a, vo a voice came out, and all the voice said, when in pain, what do you reach for? And then there was a pause, and then it said, thank you for your support. Now, at that time, this is kind of before, right now we might say, well, what was it, Advil? Was it Tylenol? It was aspirin. It was aspirin at the time. That was the go-to. So they did not mention the product nor the company that produced it in the adverti advertisement at all. All they said is, when you are in pain, what do you reach for? And the assumption was, everybody, no-brainer, would just say, well, I reach for aspirin. And that, that word would come into people's minds, and then they'd say, thank you for your support. And it would brand, it would burn that brand right into people's minds. And so it won this award. I guess this is what I'm talking about. Is Jesus a foregone conclusion in your heart and in your mind? Is he preeminent, not just prominent? This attitude of gratitude changes everything. God choosing you is not based on your performance. It's based on His grace. It's based on His forgiveness. In all 
your ways, to acknowledge him in everything, is to be fully consumed by the wonder of who he is. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying this to you today to create guilt and say, oh boy, have I ever screwed up. I'm doing it, and I'm saying this because this is the message that God is etching right into my own heart. That every moment of every day, I would begin the day making him preeminent, voicing it. Also knowing, as Paul says in Romans 7, the things I want to do, ah, man, I just, I just don't do them. The stuff that I shouldn't do, I keep on doing. Who will save me from this heart of sin? But thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Our attitude, the voice of gratitude in our lives, makes a huge difference. To admit, part of these definitions, to admit, to reveal, to recognize, and express gratitude for. You see, we seek to understand, as the ancient Hebrews did, how this concept comes through knowing, through being acquainted with, as a dear friend, that we would comprehend fully. I'm going to ask if the tenors would come up, and we're going to lead you in a response song with this. In some ways, it's sort of like a creed. And the way that it will work is that my part, I am going to, to sing a question. And then what you're going to do is you're going to sing a response. And it's all on the screen, so you'll get it. And the rest of the team, for the most part, are going to be doing the response part of it. So kind of follow them. But the name of this song, it's a relatively new song. Don't worry if you haven't heard it before. But is he worthy? And all these things that I've been talking about, they're kind of included in this song. And our encouragement to you this morning is that in the depths of your heart that you would acknowledge who Jesus is, as Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And that these words would settle in your heart. You can remain seated. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Feel the shadows deepen. We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. of this it is is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the light of Judah the conquered the grave its root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of thee? Does 
the Spirit move among us. He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the sea and open the scroll? The light of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom, a priest to God, to reign with his son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. According to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus and in Summerland and in your homes. And to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a great long weekend.